Turn-based combat is fun, but it can get really complicated really fast. That's why I keep a programming canary, a real one. And if I start making something too complicated for this bird to understand, it explodes. So today I'll be making a turn-based combat scenario that utilizes a robust inventory system. Maybe just a simple turn-based battle system and I'll kind of, I'll work my way up from there. Let's look at the fundamental fight structure and think of the ways we can build complexity out of it. We'll get to team versus team combat later, but for now, I want to focus on the fundamentals of turn-based combat. First, let's set the initial conditions before the fight. The player's maximum HP and current HP set to be equal to that first variable, the maximum HP, and then we'll do the same for the enemy. Then, we'll set the conditions for the battle loop. So while player HP is more than zero, we'll do this loop. And once the player HP hits or goes under zero, we'll go to this you died statement. Then for combat itself, we'll keep it simple. First, we'll have the player's turn, which they can either attack, reducing the enemy HP by two, or if one of their hits reduces the enemy's health below zero, they win. Or they cannot attack, which just means they won't do anything. We're keeping it simple here. Then the enemy will have their turn, which they'll attack and reduce the HP from the player. For now, before we have UI set up, we'll just announce who has how much HP by putting their HP variable in brackets and interjecting it in statements fairly regularly. Set up this way, we have a simple RPG fight done. It's a bit of a boring fight, but honestly, a lot more of it is presentation than anything else. Let me just grab a new bird real quick, and there we go. So let's take advantage of what RenPy can really do and make something cool with programming. First, we'll grab some pixel assets we can use for animations for the player, the enemies, and the environment. We'll take those images in, and to make them animated in RenPy, we'll set them in image definitions where the different images will play in sequence. Then we'll utilize some of RenPy's 3D functionality to set up these pixel assets in a scene where we can take advantage of camera functionality. By the way, if you're getting lost at all here, I cover the basics of how I'm tackling these in my RenPy Images and Action Editor video, which I'm linking to below. And finally, we'll create a simple UI screen overlay that shows the character's HP. We'll set the name and then the bars using the maximum HP values as a maximum range and the value is the current HP variable for each of these characters. Now, whenever anyone takes damage, their HP bar will automatically go down. Now, let's see it in engine. Nothing has changed strategy-wise from our initial setup, but it looks way more fun to play. For each of these actions, we're zooming the camera around at different angles, and to keep things simple, we'll be setting each of these cameras and animations as their own label, so we can call them whenever we need to. It helps keep our code from looking too bloated. Now, obviously, you can do anything you want style-wise at this point, but I won't go too into the weeds here. Instead, I want to focus on how to give gameplay a little bit more variance and depth. For instance, for my game, King of the Cul-de-Sac, I set up four different RPG fight systems based on my favorite games. Final Fantasy, Dragon Quest, Pokemon, and the insult sword fighting from The Curse of Monkey Island, which is the best one, obviously. Most of these used the same basic systems, but I worked on giving some weight and consequences to player decisions. For the Final Fantasy setup, you wanted to attack when the spider was there, but when she goes up and readies for a big attack, you want to defend. For the Pokemon one, certain moves worked better against different opponents. For the pain fight, you wanted to hit the side where the raw skin is exposed, ew. And for the clown fight, instead of selecting attacks, you're selecting the most insulting comeback. So let's take our base combat and add some weight to your decisions. Instead of attacking or not attacking, we'll give the user heavy or light attacks that have some trade-offs for choosing one or the other, utilizing some randomized dice rolls. So first, I'll make a randomized dice roll generator. Whenever we need a random number, we'll call this function, and it rolls four random numbers based on different dice. A four-sided die, a six-sided die, a 10-sided die, and a 20-sided die. Then we use the return statement here so it will return back to the loop when we're done. So back to our fight engine, we'll add the light attack and heavy attack. First, we'll roll the die and get our values set, and then when the player selects their options, we'll already have the values chosen. So for a light attack, let's give it a 30% critical rate chance and a 70% regular attack chance. So if you roll an eight, nine, or 10, your damage will be equal to a D4 plus a D6 roll. 
but if you make a regular attack, you only do d4 damage. If we want to display the amount of damage we do, we can't do math in these variables in text, so when we have critical hits, we'll need to make a separate variable, and we'll just subtract enemy damage by that to make things easier. Then for the heavy attack, it's a 20% of a critical attack, which will be twice as strong as a light attack, with double the damage of the light critical hit. But the regular strong hit will still strike for d6 plus 2 damage, but 40% of the time, the hit will miss completely. Now there's a bit more cost-benefit analysis involved with choosing one attack versus another. Then on the other end, with the enemy's choices, we'll re-roll the dice and use that to decide which action the enemy will take this round. We'll give it a 20% chance of a critical hit if it rolls a 19 or higher for a d10 damage, then a 20% chance it'll heal itself for d4 hit points, and finally a 60% chance of a d4 attack. Now, when we play through, each combat encounter will operate a little bit differently, and we can set this thing up as a loop. In fact, I set up all these different levels of RPG combat to loop. To reset everything, we just need to reset the player and enemy HP to max underscore HP again, and we can have a different fight every time. So that's how you make a turn-based combat engine. Oh right, I almost forgot. Thanks, Canary. Now for this complicated battle, we'll add, I don't know, multiple enemies, player characters, a leveling system, a simple magic point system. Ooh, with elemental weaknesses and resistances. Ooh, that'd be good. Ooh, and then we'll determine fighting order by setting up some custom classes and use list sorting. To, we'll just make it a set battle order for now. First, let's tackle the multiple characters. We'll create new sprites by copying and pasting our image definitions and renaming them, and it would be way easier if we could create some custom classes. Or we can just do it the long way. It's good too. So we have the new image definitions made for a new player character and three skeletons, and then to make them look different, I'll apply a color tint to each of them. Then we need to add stats for each of these characters. If we were making some more complicated code, we could reduce these down to a line or two, but for now we'll need to set up some variables that will change a lot during combat. So first, we'll change our while statement to while true, which will just be an infinite loop, and then make it our player's turns. Before we let the user take an action for either of these players, we'll check to see if they're still in combat by saying if player's HP is over zero. Then, if it is, we'll set the variables player current to 1, and set the player level to the first player's level and then call player attack. Player attack is a function I made so we can call this twice with two different players. If we wanted to add a third playable character in combat, it would just be a few extra lines of code to make it work. So when player attack is called, it calls the dice roll for the random variables, and then you can decide which skeleton they're attacking. By including an if statement here, the option will only be shown if the condition is met. In this case, the only skeletons you can target are ones who have HP. Otherwise, we know they're dead and out of combat. Once you set a target, we use the enemy element. In this case, whether the skeleton is a regular one or if it has fire, water, or grass type, so the game can remember which one of these skeletons we chose. Then we let the player select their attack. We have all of the attacks here. If it's players 1 or 2, they can use Sword Slash, while only player 1 gets Fire Spin, and player 2 gets Hydra Sword and Grass Blade. We'll set the damage for each one with some variation. Sword Slash will have a 30% chance of a critical hit, which is D4 plus D6, plus the player's current level as a damage bonus. Then, a 10% chance to miss, and then a 60% chance of D4 plus character level damage. We'll also set this variable, player underscore element, to sword, but I'll get to that in a bit. For the magic attacks, they'll subtract from the player's MP and set this variable, player underscore element, with the element type. Again, we'll use that later. Then we calculate damage, which will be a 10% critical chance rate and operate pretty close to how all of our attacks have been working up until now. Then we have a chunk of code where we determine weaknesses and resistances. If the enemy element, the enemy being targeted, is equal to the player element, then the enemy will be resistant to that magic and get half the damage, rounded to the nearest integer, using this little round thing here. Then, if the enemy element is attacked by its opposite, water hit by grass, fire hit by water, or grass hit by fire, it gets three times as much damage. 
We could have given an or statement between each one of these conditions to fit this all in one line, but this is easier to parse for later. Then we transfer the damage by determining the active element and then animating that enemy and subtracting the player attack value from their HP and then showing the current player attacking. Finally, we check to see if any skeletons died. If all of them are dead, then we won the encounter. But if they aren't, we check to see who's currently targeted and then see if they have zero or less HP. Keep in mind, if they're already dead, they can't be targeted, so this keeps us from activating this dialogue every round. And then finally, we return back to our battle loop and do this all again for player two. These attacks don't take a lot of time to do on the player's end, but there are a lot of factors we need to consider for every one of these actions. Now again, it would be more efficient if we used class structure, but I hope you can at least appreciate all the little things you need to consider when you're creating one of these systems. So after player two's turn, it's the skeleton's turn. Since there's four of them, we'll make a new while loop instead of putting them in sequence like the players. We'll create a variable enemy's turn and set it to zero by default. Every loop, it will check to see whose turn it is, and if they're alive, it'll set their element and call enemy attack. If it's the current turn of a skeleton who's dead, we'll set the enemy's turn to add one anyway and do the loop again until we hit four, which will then loop us back to the player's turn. So let's go into the enemy attack function. First, we call a dice roll again, and if both of the players have more than zero HP, we use the d20 to determine which one the enemy will attack. Otherwise, the skeleton will target the player who's still alive using the player underscore current variable. Once that's set, the skeleton attacks. There's a 10% chance they'll make a wild attack, which does d6 damage, an 80% chance they do a d4 damage attack, and then 10% chance they do no damage at all. So we go down to the next section, which shows the enemy attacking based on what the active element is, and then show the player getting hit. No one gets hit if the enemy attack value is zero, but the current player gets a hit animation that plays and their HP is reduced by the enemy attack value. Then finally, if the current player has their HP reduced to below zero, they get a defeated animation. And then if both of them are below zero HP, you get a you lost animation and then get sent back to the base menu. After that, the enemy's turn goes up by one and you get returned to the loop. So even though there's a lot going on, the basic battle loop is pretty short and separating out your different functions can help make this really complicated battle system more manageable to figure out. I'll be sharing a bare bones version of each of these RPG fight systems, but I'll be honest, please don't use them. These are really just there for reference. First off, Every RPG has its own twist on the turn-based battle system, and a lot of them require some fundamental changes to the base elements. And those changes might necessitate rewriting your battle systems from scratch. And second of all, my system really doesn't scale all that well. If you only have a handful of potential enemies and characters, then sure, you can probably write out everything linearly like I did. But if you are building something actually RPG length, with hundreds of different enemies, several party members that change up regularly, and skill trees and items, you're gonna find that the code I've written for you is far from efficient. Honestly, to build a good modular turn-based combat system, you really need to learn how to properly utilize classes. We'll have to stop for now because this is kind of my last canary left. Oh, um, yeah, I guess I could, I could talk about it for like a second. Uh. Yeah, uh, well, basically this whole time we've been using procedural programming. We tell the computer to do these chunks of code in order from top to bottom. You can see with all the code I've been writing at this point, we'll start from the top of a section of code and work our way to the bottom. Sure, we have functions and we can make the computer jump around and repeat stuff, but ultimately we're still making it go through an itemized list. But with object-oriented programming, we can create objects, basically telling the computer this is a type of thing that exists in this game, and these are all properties it has. And that makes it a lot easier for the computer to understand anything you define within that framework. On a real basic level, remember all those variables we set earlier for the players and enemies? Using a class system, we can create a class called Fighter and define a bunch of attributes for that class with some default values. Then we can recreate all the variables down there by defining the six different enemies and players using this class. Because we used player one as a template for the class's default values, we can just say player one is equal to this class. 
while player two, who has a higher level, will get their level equal to two, which is the first value here, and then every changed value in order until it matches the default values. Then, we can do the same with the skeletons. Now, these two chunks of code are about the same size, but keep in mind, each of those characters now has 10 variables that we can manipulate at any time using their name dot attribute. So if we want to reduce the HP of player one by two, we can write P1 dot HP minus equal to two, which will then be stored by that class. And we can make tons of new enemies and characters with little to no additional effort. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. For the next batch of RandPy videos, I'll be going over some ways to take advantage of Python's robust code base for your game, including an inventory system. So be sure to subscribe so you're ready when it comes out. Is there anything else you want to learn, little bird? Yeah, no, not gonna do no. <laughs>